welcome to everyone this morning. Um, today we're uh, excited to hear from our speaker, uh, Tommy Niemenen. <laughs> Good morning. How are you, Tommy? Uh, thanks. Good morning. Um, I'm fine, thank you. It's actually afternoon here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. We've got, these are always really international meetings now that we've been doing them virtual, and that's that's exciting. We get uh, people from all over the place. Um, so just a brief introduction uh, about Tommy before we'll let him jump into his, his talk for today. And then I think we'll try to reserve the last uh, 10 minutes or so. So at about 8.50, we'll try to move into a question and answer session. And so Tommy Niemenen has worked as a, as a translator since the year 2000 and as a translation technology developer since 2011. As a translation technology architect, he has automated translation workflows and built and deployed statistical and neural machine translation systems for language service providers and other organizations. Currently, um, Tommy Niemenen is working as a freelance translator, developer, uh, researcher, and educator. And he is devoting a large part of his time to the Opus CAT open source project, which he is going to talk to us about today. So um, without further ado, I'll turn the time over to Tommy for his talk. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, <coughs> I'll just uh, share my presentation up on my screen, actually. Uh, let me see. Um, <laughs> sorry, I haven't actually used Teams for a while, so I've completely forgotten how. Is this going to uh, share everything? Can you see my my like complete computer now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Because I'm going to be demoing, demoing some stuff here. Uh, I'm just going to see. Hopefully, there's no demo effect, but uh, it's really the only only way to <clears throat> demonstrate these things. Also, I'd like to apologize for my voice. I have a flu. Also, I might not be as coherent as as usually, which is not that coherent in the first place. But still, I'm a bit cloudy in the head. But <clears throat> I'll, I'll I'll start start now. Okay. So the uh, the topic of the presentation is, as mentioned, is Obuscat. And the, uh, the title for this is Free, Secure, and Confidential uh, for Professional Translators. So all of these are very important. I mean, all of these words are very, very sort of uh, carefully picked. I mean, these are very important parts of the whole Obuscat project is that it's free, it's secure, it's confidential, and it's for professional translators. It's not generally for people who just use machine translation for gisting or for reading websites or buying stuff from online online stores. I mean, we have Google for that, we have Bing for that, etc. Obuscat is for especially for professional translators. <coughs> uh, okay, let me just uh, move ahead. Well, here's a short bio which already kind of uh, was um, talked about. But basically, I've been a translator since 2000, kind of a generalist translator. I had a degree in philosophy originally, so basically I, I did not know anything about anything except philosophy. So I just started translating games and uh, did into software translation as well from that. And I worked in in-house in magazines. I worked in agencies, uh, SDL, which is now R RWS and Linksoft. Uh, and I've also worked as a freelance translator, well, mostly as a freelance translator for a whole variety of clients. And I still work as a translator because I like to keep in touch with the actual practical work of translation. Because <clears throat> if I would only do development, I wouldn't be able to test all the uh, all the kinds of you know stuff that I'm actually developing. So I'm actually I'm using machine translation as I develop it. In fact, like lots of the stuff in Obuscat was initially added there just so that I could use Obuscat for my own translation projects. For instance, the uh, fine tuning uh, functionality, which is like something which I'm going to go into more detail. That was for a very specific uh, project where I just discovered that 
that the generic models weren't really helping me at all translate this software project. And that, um, and then I find out that if I if I fine tune the model, even with like a very small amount of text, which is like specific to this client, suddenly it becomes very, very usable. So yeah, so it's kind of like a feedback loop between the translator and developer sites. Okay, and I've been a developer for 10 years, about you know half time basically doing translation, developing on the side. For about five years, I was like a full-time developer doing all kinds of translation workflows, etc. for Linksoft. Uh, also deployed like uh, some one of the first uh, machine translation systems in, in Finland for like uh, production use. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I'm currently I do translation, I do contract work for companies, you know, like development, etc. And also I, I do research work for universities and academic projects. Yeah, like I can, as, as a developer and translator, I can tell you what the difference between development work and translation is. And the biggest difference is that in translation, like deadlines and mistakes are like very, very serious. If you make a error in translation or you miss a deadline, that's like potentially going to ruin your career. But in the development side, if you make a mistake, there's a bug in your code or you miss a deadline, you're just going to get more money from the client. I mean, there's no such uh, thing as a sort of uh, software project which is successful from the start. But yeah, that's the funny thing which I found found in these two trades. <coughs> okay, so let's start from the history of Opus Cat. So Opus Cat is built on two previous open source projects, uh, which are both by uh, Jörg Tiedemann, who is currently the professor of language technology at University of Helsinki. Now, the first of these pro projects is Opus, which is a collection of <coughs> of basically all the all the sort of parallel corpora, meaning cor corpora where you have uh, at least two two languages for each text. So you have you know parallel text available for this this same 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 corpus which you can use to train machine translation that's the primary use of parallel corpora in any case uh, your team has collected like uh, a very nice collection of these uh, let me just see if i can open it uh, yeah he's he's been been added for quite a long time at least 15 years so <clears throat> uh, you can see that there's like a very very wide selection of uh, different open source well, freely available corpora. There might be some kind of licenses which are not open source, but but it's stuff which can be used uh, in in training openly. And a couple of years ago, uh, Jörg made Opus MT project where he started training NMT models from these Opus corpora and sort of pre-training the models and making them available to researchers, etc. Because this was like the start of the NMT boom, basically that started in in 2016. And in about 2018, we started to get like transformers, which were just much better as well. And then we started to get these nice toolkits, which uh, allowed us to train these MT models very easily. And sort of very, very simple, easy to use toolkits. So basically, that's the genesis of the Opus MT project where, where you just uh, train as many models as you can for as many uh, language pairs as you, as you can. So basically, there's at least a thousand different models available here from from uh, something you know, very, very sort of common pairs, such as the German, French, to very, very sort of uh, rare pairs. I don't even know what the GAA is actually. So, but <clears throat> you basically you get all kinds of different combinations. And once we have this collection of pre-trained models available, 
Then it's just a very small step to OpusCat. And OpusCat is just, uh, just a way to harness these free pre-trained models in professional translation, uh, which also has a side of its own there, but I'm going to skip it now. OK. OK, so just a few words about our sponsors, basically. Uh, so Opus, OpusCat is an open source project and we've received money from funding from two different uh, organizations. Uh, Svenska Kulturfondet, which is like a Finnish Swedish uh, organization and the Euro European Language Grid uh, for their pilot project. We are seeking more funding at the moment as well, so we can hopefully expand the work in the future. OK, so OpusCat, here we can see that OpusCat is uh, fundamentally it's a combination of a desktop MT engine, which is based on Merian NMT. So this is like a machine translation engine which runs on your own computer using your computer CPU to generate the machine translations. The NMT neural machine translation is, is trained, the models are trained on, on, on these uh, GPUs, so graphical processing units. Uh, and the training is extremely sort of resource intensive. But once you have the model generating the translations, isn't particularly resource intensive. And it can be done on your CPU. On any modern CPU, you can get completely acceptable performance uh, generating machine translation. And Merian NMT is, uh, is another uh, open source project, uh, which I don't think I'm actually linking here. Uh, yeah, but it's a, it's a very efficient, fast uh, decoder engine, training engine for, we can even train and decode models, use models, uh, NMT models with Merian NMT. It's very widely used nowadays for any scenario in which you need like very, very efficient, very, uh, very fast NMT. Currently it's been, uh, I think Microsoft is funding most of the development nowadays, at least the, the main developer works at Microsoft nowadays. <clears throat> and the other component of OpusCat is a collection of plugins and an API, which can be used to, so API is an application programming interface. So it means that there's like a interface in the uh, engine that can be used to sort of communicate machine translation to different tools. So I have a collection of plugins and you have an API which can then be used to integrate <coughs> this desktop machine translation engine with different CAT tools. So popular CAT tools like Trados, MemoQ, WordFast and Omega TV. So basically Trados and MemoQ, that's a pretty significant part of the market already. Uh, <coughs> pardon me, sorry about the cough. OK, so here we can see the, the sort of uh, features of OpusCat and why, why it is uh, and what makes it different from the other machine translation uh, products around. So it's open source. It's completely free for anyone since it works on your desktop computer. There's no outside service. You don't need any service to connect to. And in any case, we won't be able to fund a server which would generate the machine translations. So it's actually a very good thing that we can run it on, on like independently on people's computers. Uh, so it saves money. It makes it possible to uh, to provide. I mean, you wouldn't be able to provide a machine translation service which is on the cloud for free because those have quite a lot of costs in upkeep. So like DeepL, Modern MT, all of these like uh, best uh, machine translation cloud services, they have lots of uh, upkeep costs. But OpenSCAD doesn't have any upkeep cost at all, since all the computation is always done in the user's own computer. Uh, <coughs> and of course, yeah, we have the Merian NMT as the uh, backend uh, machine. So it's very quick, it's very fast in, in producing machine translations, but it can also even fine tune models on the local computer. 
which is uh, quite a lot more uh, so sort of resource intensive than generating the translations, but it's still perfectly feasible to run the fine tuning on your own computer. So we have here four boxes which uh, sort of describe uh, the things which are sort of fundamental when you're using machine translation in professional translation. I mean, these are not really fundamental if you're just using ma machine translation for uh, just gisting websites, etc. But if you're doing professional translation, these things have to be uh, sort of uh, guaranteed, basically. Uh, well, they aren't really nowadays, but optimally they are guaranteed. So first is confidentiality. Uh, you need to be able to ensure that the data which the client has uh, sort of entrusted in you, has given to you some confidential data, you can't really put it out to some external service, which you don't really know what they're going to do with that data. Even though, I mean, all, all of these cloud services will always uh, sort of say that they are very, very safe. They always handle the data very safely. They don't keep it. I mean, there's no guarantee of that. Since, <clears throat> I mean, they are, they are receiving the data, they are doing something with it, but it might well stay in some kind of cache or temporary file system, or they might keep it for themselves if they are being dishonest as well and use it for trading. And of course, uh, services like Google, uh, they point out that they are going to collect some data as well. Uh, but with Obuscat, since there's no external connection to any service, there simply isn't any confidentiality risk. I mean, no data is ever going to go outside your own computer. You can even use Obuscat entirely in offline, uh, in offline mode. <clears throat> And then you have the cost, cost effectiveness. So uh, all of these cloud-based services, at least the best ones, they're going to pay, uh, it, it, well, they're paid services. Uh, the cost might be quite low nowadays, but I think eventually it's at least it's going to have to go up uh, since I'm not sure how, how long these services can uh, can sort of keep on going without generating revenue from uh, the actual services that they provide. Uh, but Obuscat has no, basically no extra running costs since you're already using your computer and you have it there. And that's the customizability, which is absolutely vital for using machine translation in, in, uh, in professional translation. And as I said, you know, Obuscat can fine tune models for to customize them to clients, etc. If you have a GPU available and have some technical skills, you can even do bigger uh, customizations on your own computer by using the uh, other Opus projects. <clears throat> There's also, also the issue of reliability, as in the cloud services might go, uh, might have some problems. There might be like connection problems, etc. With Opuscat, there's no, there's no connection problem. There's no service outage, etc. If there's no company that can go bust, etc. So it's completely safe to use, and uh, no, no, safe, no, reliable to use. Sorry, it's of, of course it's safe to use as well, but it's also reliable. Okay, so the um, Opuscat, one one way of looking at it is that. We've had this sort of open source collection of uh, tools and data for machine translation available for a very long time already. Like before, even before like the neural machine translation stuff, we had uh, <coughs> statistical machine translation things which could be used uh, pretty easily, like open source stuff. Moses was like the uh, the big target on those days, and of course after NMT we got more and more open source tools. We have like uh, different ways of pre-processing data, which is all open source. Everything is open source available sort of to use freely. Uh, pretty much anything can be built, built fairly easily. 
And with Merian NMT, we also get this uh, fast local machine translation engine, which uh, sort of nicely had a had a Windows build included as well. So you could just start using it in Windows. While like normally all of this academic uh, sort of machine learning language technology stuff runs on Linux computers. Well, Merian is a good exception that it, it it's it's is also available in Windows by default. So, but one, one missing piece here is how do we combine all of these open source components to actually bring it into professional translation? And this was actually my job in in Linksoft, like in, in when I worked in the industry, my job was combining all of these components to create like a production machine translation system. But there was no open source uh, sort of thing which was uh, sort of also applicable to independent translators. There was no option like that before OpusCat. So OpusCat is like the missing piece in this uh, machine translation open source environment, which allows it to be used by the end users. All of this, uh, all of this nice work that people have been doing in, in academia, etc., in companies which they were very graciously shared with everyone, uh, OpusCat is the one, one bit which will allow us to use it easily for our work. <laughs> so you can see that uh, what, what OpusCat brings to this whole thing is CAT tool integration, all of these plugins and integration uh, possibilities with CAT tools, and also the project specific adaptation for, <coughs> for sort of, um, adapting the uh, generic machine translation models for actual translation use. All right, so here we can uh, have a look at the components in uh, OBUSCAT. So one of the, uh, well, the, the main component is the OBUSCAT MT engine, which is the application that runs on your computer. I can just demo show it here. So it's a normal Windows application which basically the, the, the main view simply shows the machine translation models which you've installed on your local computer. And then you have a possibility to install more models from the internet, from uh, the Opus MT uh, repository. And also currently we have uh, two different repositories of models. One is the Tatoeba MT models, which is a separate project, but which <laughs> produces these uh, compatible models uh, for for OpusCAD as well. Really, I mean, it's just uh, the Tatoeba models are, are the new ones currently. So we have a very large selection of, of different uh, languages. Um, you can see from here that we have for, for translation from English, in the other languages, we have 340 different models available. Well, actually, there's much more, but <coughs> much more, but uh, at least 300 different language combinations for English. Many of these are very sort of uh, low resource languages, so the quality is probably not going to be that good. But on the other hand, there's probably not much else available either for these languages. Uh, yeah, so it's a very, very wide selection of languages or models. You can see from here there's uh, 1,837 bilingual models. If you go for multilingual models, it's about 2,500. Although I wouldn't recommend using multilingual models for professional translations since they have a, they often have quality issues. Okay, so that's the. Uh, that's the model installer, and we have some other 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 uh, other other functionalities here as well. So here we go. Here's the, on the grid. That was the installer. Then we have the Marian NMT engine, which I can demonstrate with this uh, testing functionality. So this is simply for doing some quick testing of the models. This is not like a, 
uh, an interface for translating stuff really. It's just to see that that the models work. And uh, these models use guided alignment, which means that the uh, that the model pro uh, along with the translation, the model produces an alignment between the words in the source and the target, which can be used, for instance, to uh, restore tags in uh, from the source to target, which is quite important in many many professional translation scenarios. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, and then we have automatic pre and post editing rules, which is a functionality for doing a bit of pre and post editing, but it's a bit complex as an issue, so I'm not going to go into it here. And finally, which is really the most important functionality in, in this, is the fine tuning with TMs. So we have the fine tuning uh, functionality here. We can select a TMX translation memory to use as a as a as a. I'm just gonna quickly. Oh, that's a bit of big one, really. Yeah. So I mean, if we just uh, give it a label to separate it from the original model. And then we just fine tune it, and depending on the uh, on the amount of fine tuning material, it might take an hour to fine tune the model. Now, generally in in professional translation, you will have enough time to fine tune a new model if you have a project. I mean, say, of course, it's only for fairly large projects. Like, say, you have like five thousand new words to translate. <clears throat> in those scenarios, it makes sense to. Just take the translation memory and fine tune the model before starting work on the uh, on the project. But if you're translating like one one hundred words, it doesn't really uh, it doesn't make sense, of course. Okay, so I'll be returning to the fine tuning soon. Let me just check the clock. Okay, actually we are quite uh, we have some time. Okay, so. I'll just note about the terminology support. That's that's that has funding. I'm currently working on on <coughs> on adding uh, support for term bases, but it's not ready yet. It's not included yet, but it should be in about a month. Okay, so the cat tool integration is here. So we have uh, integrations with. Sorry, was that a question? No. Okay. So we have uh, integrations with Trados, NemoQ, WordFast, Memsource, Omega T. Yeah, what are you talking about? Palestra, okay. Oh, sorry, someone has a microphone on. Okay. Um, Tommy, you're you're muted right now. Okay, can you see? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Thanks. Right. Can you see the screen? Still can see the screen. The screen, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so Trados plugin is the primary plugin on account of uh, first that Trados has the best support for plugins, and also <coughs> also the. Um, that is, it has the largest market share currently for for cat tools, although it might not be true anymore. I'm not sure. I haven't checked for a while. Okay, so you have a uh, different kinds of uh, uh, options here. For instance, for tag restoration, uh, for uh, choosing a model tag, which basically means that you can uh, choose a fine-tuned model, for instance, to use for you use. Uh, in translation, and you can have multiple plugins uh, active at the same time, so that you can see out from two different <coughs> machine translation models. Like in this case, uh, we have several. Uh, we, there's, a, there's a base model here, and there's a fine-tuned model. Uh, the top one is the base model, I think, and the the one below 
is the fine-tuned one. And I think the difference here is that it's basically uh, included uh, COVID-19 in, in, in the translation. <coughs> uh, COVID, COVID was one of the uh, sort of fine-tuning uh, challenges since like most of the uh, uh, parallel corpora we have, of course, are from the time before COVID. So basically, none of the models are very good at translating COVID-related texts. But once you fine tune the models with texts that does that do contain uh, like COVID terminology, etc., then it starts working properly. So that's like one of the examples of how the fine tuning can can have a big effect on the <coughs> usability of of uh, machine translation. Okay, so we have Trial Studio plugin, uh, MemoQ plugin, which is uh, a bit more basic in MemoQ since it doesn't really have the same level of plugin support. For WordFast, uh, we can use uh, Obuscat through this custom MT functionality, which means that we use the API of Obuscat directly. So we add this uh, address for the <coughs> Obuscat API here in the settings, and these are all documented in the in the instructions for Obuscat, by the way. And then we can simply. I don't actually use word faster often, so I don't know where it is. Yeah, and then we can. Receive the machine translations here in the in the same way as as in the products. So. Uh, and then Omega T, we also have a plugin, but for MemSource and XTM, which are browser based uh, translation editors, it's a bit more complicated since they really don't have any plugin uh, capabilities. Uh, but luckily, since they are running in the browser, we can sort of circumvent this problem by using a uh, by using a browser extension. So that's why you have this um, browser extension for uh, Chrome available, <coughs> which is over here. You have OpusCAD extension which again connects to the API of Obuscat. You know, the MT engine which is running here in my computer. And we'll get the translations from there. Uh, so it's a bit different to use since we don't have a we don't have a UI. So we need to use it through this kind of an overlay, which is part of the uh, which is part of the Opus MT engine, and we just have to do this little trick here as well to set this as an override model. And now we can basically the extension will extract the source text from MemSource and send the source text to the MT engine. The MT engine will generate the uh, <coughs> translation in the overlay, and then we can use a browser uh, shortcut key to copy the translation in into the browser. And one one very nice point about this feature is also that it's it doesn't really show up in any way to in MemSource. So basically, there's no way of uh, anyone tracking the use of of OpusCat, which basically means that you're completely free to use it in any any sort of <coughs> job you might have. Uh, so yeah, I, mean, I personally find this very very useful to be able to use machine translation freely in any any kind of browser based. Uh, Cut tool. Of course, it, it requires some some changes to the extension whenever a new tool is introduced. So currently, it only supports MemSource and XTM, but it's quite simple to add add any any of these editor based tools uh, in there. Okay, uh, and Omega T, yeah, that's a plugin as well. Uh, not sure how many people use it, but okay, I'm just gonna hide the overlay again. Okay, so yeah, so cat tool integration, that's like a necessary condition for using uh, machine translation in professional translation, but it's not sufficient 
on the count of that, I mean, this is like a software development term, brownfield project. And basically it means a project where you have a set of uh, <coughs> material left over from the previous work that you're not building on something completely new. You have lots of things you have to take into care, take into account when you work on the project. So this is like pretty much all professional translation work is brownfield work. Because you always have the translation memories, you have the style guides, you have the term bases. So you can't fully really use the stuff that comes out of the generic MT because it doesn't uh, <coughs> it doesn't conform to the translation memories, it doesn't conform to the style guides or the term bases. So it's pretty much useless uh, unless you have a greenfield project. This is like a completely new project, then it might be all right. But even in those cases, uh, you want consistency from the uh, output. You don't want it to change the translation of different terms in different contexts. So what this means is that you need to have the adaptation in order to use uh, MT in professional translation. That's another sort of necessary condition for using it. So it's get tool integration. I have it here actually. Get tool integration project specific adaptation. These are the necessary conditions for using MT in professional translation. All right, so the adaptation, as you can see, well, I, I displayed it already, that you have the pre-trained generic MT model uh, over here. And then you can fine tune it with, with your own data. And then you get the fine tuned model. <coughs> Another way of adapting is using the edit rules, which basically allow you to make these uh, rules which can be used to like uh, correct systematic errors in, in source texts. Like, like very often, at least I come across source texts which have not been written by native English speakers. So they have these very sort of obvious uh, reoccurring errors in them. So you can use a pre-edit rule to sort of modify that. And then you have uh, post-edit rules, which you can use to uh, change sort of systematically incorrect machine translations as well. But these are manual rules. They take a bit of uh, work to, to use as well. So, uh, but they, they are, they're, they're not an option to, to make it more feasible to use MT. <laughs> and terminology, which is going to come on, come in about a month, etc., which is, uh, as I mentioned, term bases. You can use term base in, in, in as, as an input to a translation, and then the machine translation model will enforce the use of the terminology in the target. Uh, so this would be basically uh, support the fine tuning. I think the fine tuning doesn't always guarantee that the correct term is used, but the terminology support uh, should do that. All right, so uh, here's the sort of the place of Obuscat within the current sort of MT ecosystem. So we got Obuscat, then we got client provided MT. For instance, agents, many agencies run their own MT systems. Uh, many sort of big companies also have their own MT. Uh, then a cloud based MT like DPL at modern MT, etc. So compared to these, uh, Obuscat is free. It can be used in all projects. And it's also adaptable. And this is all kind of, uh, you know, the advantage is, is, is with Obuscat in these cases. I mean, the disadvantage with Obuscat is that obviously there's not as much development resources spent on it as these uh, other company, uh, <coughs> which, which have you know, like uh, lots of funding behind them. But still, I'm the, the, the quality is not that different from, I mean, NMT is quite forgiving in that sense. And especially when you adapt the, the models uh, with the with the client specific uh, data, then the, the kind of, that alleviates the difference between, you know, the quality wise between these commercial products. Uh, then let's see if I have much time. We only have about 10 minutes of time before. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the, um, the sort of viewpoint here from from the whole technical product side and 
just to see what what the sort of um, motivation for the Opus Cat and what sort of effect I hope to gain by working on this project is. So first of all, here's like a taxonomy of translators, which I'll <coughs> which I'll sort of come up with. So we have this the whole translation trade, which you can then divide into two different parts, independent translators and internal translators. And then in the independent side, you have boutique stuff, you know, the people who get paid quite a lot for producing very sort of high end translations, very, very talented people. Uh, then about translators who translate the bulk stuff and who also make up bulk of the translation trade, you know, just normal freelancers who do software marketing, etc., documentation. And then you have the platform workers who work on different kinds of uh, micro micro work platforms or kind of you know, translation platforms, which have uh, recently become uh, quite common. Then on the internal translator side, you have the public sector companies, and then you have the agency translators. And the point of this taxonomy is that from the point of view of machine translation adoption, adoption all of these <coughs> groups are in different uh, positions there. If we consider the normal way of uh, adopt, uh, empty adoption, which is like the most common at this point, is top-down adoption, whereby either clients of independent translators or employers of uh, of these internal translators start adapting, uh, start implementing machine translation, and then they push it over to the uh, to the contractors or employer employees. <coughs> so I've used this. Uh, shade of color to sort of indicate how how sort of much this affects these uh, translators. So basically boutique translators are pretty much immune from machine translation. Uh, bulk translators are quite, you know, quite well affected there. And platform workers are just going to be, well, that's one of the things that these platforms are built on is MT adoption. I mean, many of them are basically empty systems with sort of editors on top of them. Uh, so for in this top down scenario, platform workers are like the, the main main audience. And then on the actual uh, internal side, translator side, you have public sector translators, company translators who will have some push in the machine translation. Uh, and the, but then you have the agency translators uh, and agencies are the ones who are pushing MT uh, most sort of uh, forcefully. And also agency translators are kind of um, out of this internal translators. They probably have the more precarious situation. I don't actually know if there are that many agency translators left nowadays. I think at least in Finland, most of them uh, were sort of got rid of quite a while ago. I think. Uh, RWS still has some, but, but it's quite, a, quite rare otherwise. Uh, so in this top-down scenario, we can, we can see that uh, some parts of the trade are more affected than the others. And I've, I've just pasted one, one screenshot from the European Language Industry Survey here, which demonstrates how much uh, a machine translation has actually been implemented in private companies, uh, public agencies, etc. So you can see that it's actually quite high the percentage nowadays. I mean, the international public agencies and private companies, we're talking about 80%, which is quite a lot of push to use machine translation. Uh, but local agencies uh, actually aren't that, <coughs> that sort of, uh, it's only about 50 or 60. And of course, even, well, I mean, there are levels to this. I mean, for some companies, they probably haven't implemented it for all languages, etc. So the actual take up of MT might be much lower. Okay, so the other way of implementing machine translation is then bottom up, where 
actual individual translators pick up machine translation and start using it in their work. And this will mainly apply the boutique translators, bulk translators, and also on the internal side for public sector and company translators. I mean, I know for uh, that in, in Finland at least, I mean, lots of the public sector uh, organizations use Obuscat because that was Obuscat was originally developed as part of this uh, uh, FISCMER project, which, uh, which liaised a lot with the public sector uh, organizations. And along, you know, in the in the course of that, they started using Obuscat, uh, but mainly sort of driven by the translators. So translators would themselves start using the tool, not not something which was top down. It wasn't sort of enforced by the organization. It was the individual translators who picked it up. So we can see that in this part, there's a lot of growth potential, since uh, according to the European Language Industry Survey. Uh, it's only about 30% of uh, independent language professionals who use machine translation regularly. So there's a lot of room for growth for this bottom-up uh, machine translation adoption. Uh, but there are some obstacle, obstacles here. Uh, and like, these are three obstacles which I, I mean, these are not based on surveys or anything. These are like my, my intuitive or based on my experience in the field. Uh, the obstacles are currently, I mean, previously one of the obstacles was like uh, sort of uh, reluctance to use machine translation. That I think is more, mostly gone. But nowadays it's confidentiality issues, cost, and also the unsuitability of the generic empty. And Opuscat addresses all of these issues. So <coughs> it's kind of made for this bottom up growth of empty adoption. Uh, so, and that's where the take up of Obuscat is also. It's in the bulk translation trade, it's in the public sector, it's in the company translators. And we have a fairly large user base at this point. I mean, I don't know, are we up to a thousand users? I don't know, but it's, it's still, it's, it's I, I don't really track the user counts, but, but judging by the downloads, I mean, I'd say over a thousand users might be realistic. Uh, so, so we're getting a lot of take up from these different groups. And that's kind of been our goal as well. So what is so good about the bottom up adoption of MT then? I mean, what's it, why, why do we want that? And the reason is that if you don't get it done from the bottom up from the starting from the independent translators or the, or the sort of independent uh, you know, that they em employ translators who have a lot of autonomy in their work. Otherwise, we're going to get it from the top down, enforced by the clients and the employers. <laughs> and this is not going to be good for the translation profession in the long run. Like right now, we already probably the ones who work in the translation trade have probably seen the shift towards the kind of pl platform work. I mean, you've got quite a lot of sort of venture capital uh, backed firms which have this kind of empty based platform on which they uh, hire translators to work on. I mean, I'm not going to name any names, but uh, yeah, a lot of them are not really optimal for translation work and they <coughs> really kind of demean, you know, they devalue the translation profession. And to be honest, I'm not sure if many of them have much of a business case either. I mean, but currently they have just been pumped full of cash from the uh, venture capital world. So they have that. Uh, so if we come from the bottom up, uh, this will sort of, this will enable the translator to control the tools and workflows that they use in their work. And they can expand their skill sets as in when they work with the machine translation, they will learn how to fine tune uh, models, how to curate data, etc. How to modify, you know, just to uh, identify machine translation problems. Basically, this is going to have these kind of uh, transferable skills related to MT if they are working on this technology out of their own <coughs> own initiative. And also, they will get a larger share of the MT efficiency gains. And there's quite a lot of 
translation work that still doesn't come up with doesn't come with machine translation from the client. And in those cases, you can easily make like, I don't know, 20% uh, gains in efficiency by using MT. So that's 20%, which is increasing your own income. And also when you use MT machine translation independently, you have an idea of what the sort of baseline quality for machine translation is. So that if someone offers you machine translation from top down, and you're given like a discount, for instance, I don't know, like 50%, you can sort of easily see if it's, well, you can see much, well, it's easier to see if that's a <coughs> justified rate. Uh, by the way, 50% is never justified, but but I, I've seen offers like that from some places. Whilst in, if we sort of have the top-down scenario, <laughs> translators will lose control over their tools and workflows, they're going to be dependent on the specific clients and their environments and all their whims regarding like uh, different payment structures, etc. And also they're going to take a big cut out of the machine translation efficiency gains. So not, not much of that is going to sort of uh, uh, rip down, you know, trickle down to the translators, to be honest. I mean, that never happens. Uh, so and also many of these, I mean, one of the problems is that the payment structures are becoming so strange that it doesn't really make much sense anymore. Um, no one's really figured out a good way to, to price machine translation yet. And I'm kind of not optimistic about it ever happening. Okay, so <coughs> just to continue, so the primary motivation of Obuscat, the project where we are doing this uh, is that we're just going to try to, at this point when it's still possible, is to try to nudge the adoption of MT into the into a direction that's going to be more beneficial to translators. Because I'm a translator myself, so I kind of uh, have a sort of uh, affection towards the, the professional, etc. Uh, and also, you know, I think the optimal situation would be that translation remains a skilled profession. Now, the MT adoption is kind of uh, challenging that, but it's not inevitable that the machine translation is going to sort of de-skill translators. Uh, but a lot of it depends on, um, as I said, you know, whether this change will come from top down or from bottom up. So whether it's going to be driven by the clients or by the translators themselves. So uh, what we wanted to do eventually is, you know, to maintain sort of professionalism in the translation trade is that uh, <coughs> translators should become, this is again like a, an old software term, like power user of machine translation. And like power user in the software sense means like a user who is capable of using like advanced features of certain software. I mean, they're not developers as such, but they're very familiar with all the kinds of uh, different functionalities available in their software. For instance, they can use regular expressions, etc. So this is really what, what we are aiming at, is to uh, give translators the possibility to become like uh, experts in MT use independently. Okay, sorry, uh, it's five minutes to six, so I think now would be a time for questions if you have any. <coughs> All right, thank you uh, very much, uh, Tommy, for the presentation. It was excellent, and we'll now open time up for questions. Uh, if you would like to just simply um, mute your mic uh, or unmute your mic and, and state your question verbally, that would be great. You could also raise your hand so that I could call on you, or you could also throw a question in the chat if you'd like, and I'll read it.
All right, so let's hear a question from Antonio uh, Doral. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, great. Sorry, I don't have a camera right now. So I want to say I really like it, uh, the talk and the project, and I totally agree about this uh, bottom-up approach. I think it's really great work. And uh, my question is about empty systems. So as I understood, uh, you can use a Marian-based empty system from Opus MT. So I was wondering if it's possible to use also systems trained with Marian, but not in uh, in Opus MT. Yeah, you should be able to <coughs> use them. I mean, it's a question of uh, uh, well, I mean, it's it's modifiable at least. I mean, there might be like different pre-processing uh, pipelines, which might not work out of the box, but it should be easy enough to modify it. If it works with Marian, yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be doable. <coughs> it might it might require some changes, but yeah, theoretically, yes. All right, thank you. I think we also saw a hand up from uh, from Michael. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very nice talk. I was wondering uh, when you fine tune the models. We have a large amount of audiovisual translation, so subtitles basically. Is that suited? Because I assume it's a very different kinds of uh, chunks, very different syntax, and so on. Uh, is it possible to fine tune the system to do a good job there, also for audiovisual translation? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, generally the problem is like the uh, what's it called, the timings, etc., or you know, dividing yeah. the text up to. So, uh, to be honest, I don't think that's gonna work. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna produce something which looks like subtitles, but it's probably gonna be useful for actual subtitling. So it's gonna it's gonna produce uh, subtitle like text, which okay. doesn't really fit into the. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think it, I think. Uh, our question is not so much the timing, but uh, so this fine tuning is not only then terminology, but also the structure of the sentences. Uh, it's it's it it's, this one it's basically it's everything. Yeah, so mm. it will like even like, like NMT is really great. One of the things about it is it's like it's so easy to so it's so malleable that it picks up all of these differences in uh, in sentence structure and terminology and phraseology quite easily from like fairly small bits of text. It's it's, really, it's quite it's kind of like magic, to be honest. <clears throat> OK, there was another question here whether um, whether the system also works on Linux. So you showed this works for uh, Windows, but uh, uh, whether it also works on Linux platforms. For for Linux, I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't work currently, I mean, since most most of the cat tools are like Windows only, so that's that's. I mean, it should really be. It should be ported over to Linux. Uh, to be honest, it was kind of a mistake to to do it in Windows only mode. But I think Windows basically covers so much of the professional translation world. But I would like to make it available for Linux as well. But <laughs> unfortunately, it's it's been designed this way at this Thank point. You. Thank you. Um, if no one has another question, I have one question, if that's all right, uh, Tommy. Um, I was wondering, in your experience with the the fine tuning that you can do with this tool, about how many segments would you say is necessary for um, your training data for the fine tuning to make it worth it, to make the impact noticeable? Um, 10,000 will be enough at least. <clears throat> That's like uh, for software texts, uh, like I I mean, I, I get these software projects where, where you have like these old strings, like uh, pre translated strings. So there's like 10,000 pre translated strings. If, if you run that, fine tune with that, it really makes a big difference. 
at least on the on these projects in which I've tried it. It has a very noticeable noticeable difference in in those cases. So it depends, of course, in how how specific the fine tuning material is. I mean, it's 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 all about the context, but at least in in the cases where I've tried it, it's it's you know ten thousand has been enough. Okay, thank you. And it looks like we have a question from um, from Anna Gerbero Farenas. Um, says, "Great talk, thank you." I was wondering if you use M mem source with Opus MT in the browser. Do we upload our data as well to Opus MT? Uh, no, it does no. Up there's no upload of data with Opus. I mean, we don't, we don't have any infrastructure for for running web services. So basically, I mean, even if we wanted to collect data, we don't, we just can't afford it, to be honest. So no, there's, there's no connection at all from, I mean, the, the mem source one, the way it works is uh, that the browser will locally send the source text uh, to the MD engine, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere else. It just stays on the local computer. The communication is is local in this case. So yeah, so it's always it's always going to be confidential. <laughs> okay, great. And it looks like we have a question from Kadir. Uh, you can go ahead and mute your mic. Unmute your mic. Excuse me. Hi there, Tommy, thanks for the project. I'm using it as a translator. I'm really benefiting from it. I even use it some in, in some group projects. And I'm going to ask you about the fine tuning process. As far as I know, we cannot uh, further fine tune it uh, more than once. Uh, the, the model, we cannot train it more than once, but uh, sometimes it needs more than that. Or uh, I need more than uh, the f first fine tuning provides. Uh, so, will the terminology make up for it? That's my question, and thank you again. Okay, thanks. Uh, the terminology support <coughs> I, uh, that depends um, uh, quite a lot of how how good a term base you have, of course. And I think the fine tuning, I mean. Actually, many many people have asked about like the fine tuning uh, several times uh, serially. Uh, I've always answered that I don't really know what happens there, so it might actually work, but I'm not sure. I mean, because I don't really have a possibility of of actually researching this that much, so it's kind of impressionistic always. But uh, but I would suppose that given a good term base, the terminology support is going to make a difference there. So at least that's the, that's the objective, but let's see how the implementation goes. All right, fantastic. Well, um, if there's no further questions, I think uh, in the interest of time, um, we'll end the talk here. And uh, we're very, very grateful to you, uh, Tommy, for presenting on this topic here and I think we're we're excited to to go home and download the the <laughs> program and get started with it. You do that. Thank you so much. Very great okay. talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>